Hello and a very warm welcome to our Erwin Mitchell IHT Planning webinar. IHT Planning in 2021, a really important and interesting year for us all. Um, let me introduce myself. I'm John Bunker. I'm a consultant, solicitor and chartered tax advisor with Erwin Mitchell. And it's been my honour and pleasure to be the co-editor of our new book, which I shall say a little bit about in a moment. Um, but first of all, a bit of housekeeping. Um, thank you to all of those of you who have submitted questions in advance. We've had some really good questions, which I will pick up either as we go through or in the Q&A at the end. If you'd like to submit any more questions, please do um, as we go along. Uh, use the Q&A function on your screen. And we will try and answer those uh, either as we go or, or at the end. If you could add your name and your email, um, if we're not able to get to an answer for you, we will give you a personal response after the event. So, um, so do put your email in so that we can then respond to you. Um, we are recording this virtual event, and so you will get a recording sent out to you afterwards. Uh, towards the end of the session, we will be posting a feedback link, and we'd be really pleased if you were able to spend just a couple of minutes to uh, let us know your feedback and how you feel about um, about what we've uh, what we've done today. So uh, I hope you're going to find this next hour to be valuable and give you some useful insights. Um, we are looking to explore some of the key themes in IXT planning in 2021, all of which are explored in great deal great deal of more detail in, in the book. Um, we were very pleased when the Law Society approached us to uh, to, to do this book, uh, which they published shortly before Christmas. It's written by a team of 15 specialists from across uh, Irby Mitchell, uh, and it's been my honour to, honor to be a co-editor with my colleague Anthony Nixon. Just a few thoughts on the book before we get into the meat of the, the IHT planning. First of all, it is a practical book for, uh, for you to um, advise clients and to dip into for ideas. We hope you will see it as something that will give you possibilities and open up ideas for you. I have one solicitor who looked at it and said, oh my goodness, I've just seen this and that is such a really valuable thing. And it's just, it was a big light bulb for her. She just could see now something that could really make new possibilities for her clients. And I hope that, that many of you will find that same thing. If you do need any help with anything, we'd be pleased to be able to help you. May I say something quickly about our approach to IHT planning? As a firm, we believe in estate planning. Uh, we believe in the integration of legal, tax planning and financial planning. Those three disciplines working together. We regularly do the legal and tax advice. In fact, we can do all three parts. But a lot of our time, we're working with other financial planners, wealth managers, investment managers. And I often talk about a three-legged stool. We do the legal and tax stuff. We've got someone else who does the financial planning and the cash flow and all of that. And then someone else who's a fund manager who can then do the detailed work on the portfolio. Together, we can get better solutions for clients. And those solutions we're looking at are all mainstream. There's, everything is about making the system work for your clients. Nothing here should scare the horses. You know, there's nothing here where the revenue would say that is that is oh golly that is that is that is tax avoidance because the revenue are, are really trying to squeeze tax planning they're trying to make us see less and less possibilities they're trying to say more and more things are avoidance rather than planning but we mustn't be put off by that we must know what they're saying we must know what they say the limits are and take their guidance seriously but then say this is genuine planning and therefore we can do this we avoid anything which is contrived or abnormal. And that's one of the great things that we are trying to do is to, is to, to give you solutions that are actually mainstream solutions that can work for your clients. And so let's look at IHT planning in 2021. These are, of course, exceptional times. We, we have a, a budget on the 3rd of March. Will it be a budget that includes tax or will it just be about spending? Who knows? We, 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 we can't know then, but at some point, whether it's March or the summer or the autumn, at some point we will have to have new taxes to pay for COVID. We will be anticipating some of those tax changes, some of the things that we need to put into the mix in advising our clients. But in the meantime, we need to make the most of the planning opportunities. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not going to get any better than this. 
Now is the time to plan with your clients. And if I can give you one classic example of that, normal expenditure out of income exempt. That is only going to go one way, folks. So use it now, use it effectively, make the most of it while you can. The Office of Tax Simplification is suggesting that CGT rates are going to be brought more into line with income tax rates. That we don't need a big annual exemption of 12,300, we can have a nominal exemption. Don't take it for granted. Those things are there, let's use them. Let's make sure that we can make our IHT and CGT work for clients and do the planning so that they don't miss opportunities and look back and think, if only. No one wants to say, if only I'd done something in January or February. So there we are. That's my little thought for the to get us started. Let us now go straight into one of our big subjects and introduce my colleague, Kat Wainman, who is one of our senior associates in our Leeds office just in May and heads our rural offering, where Kat is going to share with us some thoughts on BPR and APR and will drafting. So Kat, over to you. Thanks very much. Thanks, John. Um, it's been much talked about um, over the last nine months or so that taxes will need to be raised to pay for the economic impact of COVID-19. And indeed, as, as John alluded to for years before that, that certain aspects of agricultural and business release from inheritance tax looked vulnerable to change. Um, the Office for Tax Simplification published their second report on inheritance tax back in 2019 um, in what were earlier, more optimistic times. But even then they were suggesting tightening the trading threshold for business relief from inheritance tax by replacing um, the current wholly or mainly test with the substantially trading test, which applies for entrepreneurs relief and capital gains tax holdover relief purposes. Following the Brander case or the Balfour case, as it's um, also known, 100% business relief from inheritance tax is available where there is in, in broad terms um, more than 50% trading business activity. In my line of work, lots of, of work was done um, in the wake of, of that ruling to restructure rural businesses and um, landed estates to meet this test and, and understandably HMRC have never liked it. Um, in contrast, the substantially trading test broadly requires 80% trading activity, which um, many uh, rural businesses and, and estates can't meet. Um, and such a change will adversely affect many of those businesses which have diversified for, for good reasons. The OTS report also recommended removing the capital gains tax base cost uplift on debt um, if there's 100% inheritance tax relief or if spouse exemption applies, as did the OTS's first capital gains tax report, which came out in November. Um, I think it's fair to say that the, the government coffers have been substantially depleted since these reports were commissioned. And it seems that uh, the tax free uplift on death as we know it looks set to go. Um, and I can see the rationale behind that. Um, there is in effect a, a double relief there and it does distort behaviour. We often advise clients to hold on to assets pregnant with gains in order to wash out gains on death rather than transferring them onto the next generation during their lifetimes. Um, it remains to be seen whether agricultural relief will be scrapped or restricted, um, particularly in relation to let property or whether the government will go further and introduce gift taxes, um, which is in line with many other jurisdictions. Next slide, please. Um, this background makes it perhaps even more important than ever for clients to get their planning right now, um, in particular in relation to the structuring of their wills. This means keeping wills up to date and ensuring that full advantage is taken um, of any reliefs by appropriate structures in, in their wills. For married clients with relievable agricultural or business property, this means banking that relief at the earliest opportunity. Um, that may be simply by leaving those qualifying assets into a discretionary trust on the first death. They are then outside the estate of the survivor for inheritance tax purposes on the second death, but they can still access them and benefit from them. 
And even if the business or the land is then sold following the first death, or if the reliefs are subsequently changed or abolished, the assets in that trust are outside of the estate of the survivor for inheritance tax purposes on the second death. And, and that relief has importantly been, been crystallised. There may be um, even be opportunities to, to use this type of structuring to swap relievable assets with assets which would be taxable in the estate of the surviving spouse in order to get a second bite of the cherry and claim relief for a second time on the second death. Including a legacy in the wills um, of, of both relievable agricultural business property, together with the available nil rate band allowances of the first to die onto a discretionary trust can also help reduce the estate of the survivor in order to keep it below the two million pound threshold for claiming the re residence nil rate band on the second death. The, the residence nil rate band legislation can be complicated and the OTS have suggested simplific simplification to it, particularly in relation to the downsizing rules, but it's worthwhile really looking at that and getting that the structuring right to, to maximise that. So it could mean um, a valuable additional um, up to £350,000 of relief might be available uh, between a married couple. I think it's also important to stress that this isn't a matter of, of leaving it and sorting it out with a variation after death. Um, the writing back provisions in relation to post-death variations um, don't apply to income tax which can cause problems and and also problems can arise where there are minor or unborn beneficiaries who can't sign a deed variation. Equally passing assets from the surviving spouse um, following the first death Onto, onto children is, is plain vanilla standard planning and um, this starts to look more dubious if you if the estate's been varied first to say uh, give the spouse an interest in an asset and then subsequently steps are taken to pass those assets on to children or grandchildren shortly after. Um, HMRC have challenged this type of, of arrangement and it's just better to get it right in the will before death um, if we can. It might likewise be a good time to look at gifting assets onto the next generation or into trust, given the currently low rates of capital gains tax, that, and as John alluded to at the beginning, or where values may have fallen um, in current times. Or uh, also if one takes the view that current reliefs are vulnerable, then it would be best to, to take advantage and, and make use of those now. One of the best things about lockdown in this context for me um, has been the opportunity for families to often gain some clarity on what they really want out of life and and has given many the time to have some honest conversations about their succession planning. Some clients have decided to retire or decided that they don't want to continue in the family business for example um, and one family I act for have, have decided in lockdown after a, a number of years discussing their planning um, that what's really important to them is that they're a really close family, they love where they live and living in close proximity and, and this clarity has enabled them to do some really important restructuring. I think the, the current tax environment, Covid and the economic aftermath which will follow um, and the likely loss and or narrowing of agricultural business and holdover reliefs mean it's a really good time to consider succession planning with clients and to maximise the availability of the, the reliefs that there currently are through wills and lifetime planning. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. That's, uh, that's so, great. If we're looking at succession planning, we need to look no further than to one of our partners in our London office, Helen Clark is our specialist in the business wealth field who um, uh, has written the uh, couple of chapters in the book on this subject and uh, uh, and heads up our business wealth offering. So Helen, a uh, great chance now to look at the whole issue of succession planning and some of the IHT issues there. Over to you, yeah. thank you. Thank you, John. Um, so I'm going to briefly cover lifetime IHT planning for business owners. So. I'll look at um, key IHT and CGT issues, um, discuss some pre-sale planning opportunities, 
look at share transfer to the next generation and also flag some post exit planning after a liquidity event. So I'll use an owner managed business scenario to illustrate the points and let's assume we have a limited company. So key IHT and CGT issues. The first step for tax purposes is to ascertain if a business is a trading business or an investment business. There's a clear distinction between the two for tax purposes and this impacts lifetime planning opportunities. So why is it relevant? A trading business enjoy significant reliefs and the viability of a particular course of action for an owner is often determined by the tax cost and its affordability, especially if a business isn't being sold. If there's liquidity, it might be less of a concern. So trading businesses qualify for tax release for inheritance tax and capital gains tax. CAP discussed business property relief, say BPR for inheritance tax that's available to trading businesses and this can relieve up to 100% of the value of a business from inheritance tax. So it's relevant for lifetime planning as well as on death. It's incredibly generous relief and it presently has the low trading threshold that Kat mentioned, so wholly or mainly test. We anticipate it will be aligned with capital gains tax, so increasing to the 80-20 test and therefore owners might be advised to consider accelerating lifetime planning if they have BPR available now. So currently we are looking at a number of scenarios for clients, um, just, just to give you an idea. So we're, we're assessing group company structures for BPR, where there's a mix of trading and investment activity within the group. Um, some clients are looking to uh, reconstruct or demerge to basically separate out investment element to ensure that there is BPR and then there's the possibility of doing something with that BPR to bank it. Um, also looking at company balance sheets and considering stockpiled cash, reviewing if businesses genuinely need the cash or if it will negatively impact availability of BPR and if so, how to extract the cash tax efficiently. So in most cases, we advise that investment activities should be done outside of a trading group structure. And it's always better to get the correct structure um, from the outset to avoid unnecessary costs and tax charges further down the line. But obviously some clients have their structures set up. So what can they do um, lifetime planning wise in antici anticipation of a sale? So basically, um, BPR enables controlled lifetime succession planning without incurring an inheritance tax charge. So without BPR, a donor can only make gifts, outright gifts, which are a pet for inheritance tax because a transfer to a trust over the value of the nil rate band without BPR would trigger tax at the lifetime rate of 20%. So obviously this, this uh, in most instances is to be avoided. Um, so if BPR is available, a trust is a good vehicle to hold equity and it enables an owner to retain control. So um, the donor can settle an unrestricted amount, no IHT charge and it banks the relief while it's available. The donor can retain control as trustee to protect the running of the business. Shares can be held for a pool of family members. Um, the only point to note is that a trust does offer little protection in the event of divorce of a beneficiary. So we achieve IHT planning and control, but asset protection might still need addressing. So post sale, when the trustees are in receipt of the sale proceeds, they might then look to invest in a structure such as a family investment company if asset protection for the next generation is a concern. And I'll expand on this shortly. So. Um, for CGT to flag that we've got business asset holdover relief if an outright gift of a share in a trading business is being made or otherwise holdover relief is available on transfer to a qualifying trust. So there are lifetime planning opportunities if reliefs are available. If an owner is anticipating a sale, they need a um, capital event to fund retirement. Um, there might also be no um, successor within the family. So a sale for them will unlock value in the business for their retirement, but then they have the loss of IHT relief. So, you know, as soon as an owner enters into a binding contract for sale, BPR is lost. 
So we have 100% relief is lost, and then you have a resulting 40% tax charge on death if estate planning isn't undertaken, so it's quite significant. So proceeds of sale could be reinvested in other business property and benefit from replacement property rules. So the application of these rules overcomes the statutory two-year ownership requirement for BPR, meaning that the combined period of ownership is aggregated, so this can be helpful. Also, quick point to flag, if there's a deathbed sale being made, cross-option agreements should be considered rather than entering into a binding contract for sale so that BPR isn't lost to the detriment of the beneficiaries of the vendor's estate. And um, also in this scenario, company accounts should be reviewed to ascertain the value of any credit on a director's loan account. So directors often have loan accounts and a credit balance doesn't attract BPR. So there is some planning that can be done to um, convert the loan into shares to qualify for business property relief. So that's trading businesses. Next, I'll look at an investment business. So if a business doesn't have trading status, it's deemed an investment business for tax purposes. It's then denied the benefit of BPR and business asset holdover relief for CGT on outright gifts. The planning is then very difficult. Um, if an investment business is retained in an estate, there's a 40% IHT charge on death if we don't have spouse exemption or charity exemption. So typically um, this tax charge is anticipated, but it is preferred um, for investment businesses rather than paying the tax during lifetime due to liquidity issues. So one of the typical scenarios we encounter is uh, property businesses, so property investment businesses, so they only qualify for BPR if the business does not consist wholly or mainly of making or holding investments. And HMRC looks at every case on its facts and it's not the level of activity employed in a business that's the determining factor, but the nature of the business itself. So even if there is a significant degree um, of management involved in respect of a letting portfolio, it won't qualify. Development companies qualify, provided that the company is actively developing land or building on it. So with the absence of BPR and business asset holdover relief for CGT succession planning without prohibitive tax consequences can be limited. So taking the property investment company scenario, a new investor might be advised to consider using a family investment company type structure from the outset so that some of the growth is held for the next generation. If lifetime planning isn't undertaken, the business will simply form part of the chargeable estate on death for IHT. There'll be an uplift in the base value of the shares received by the beneficiaries for CGT and if beneficiaries have capital needs or otherwise can't fund the IHT liability, then some of the properties will need to be sold at that time. So finally, um, I look at the transition from being a business family. So there has been a sale, a liquidity event, and the family are now an investment family and want to look at some succession planning options. So I discussed trust earlier, the use of trust pre-sale. Um, and flag the asset protection point. So another point to consider is the impact of decennial and exit charges to tax. They can be significant if BPR isn't available. A family investment company is an alternative vehicle for succession planning and it can be used in combination with trusts. So a FIC, what's a FIC? So it quite simply is a family investment company. So it's a non-trading vehicle for pooled family wealth. It provides an effective solution for anybody with surplus assets, preferably cash for tax reasons, hence why it works well on the sale of a business when there is a liquidity event. Other assets could be sold to the company, but then there would be CGT and stamp duty to consider. So a FIC should be viewed as a long-term investment vehicle used for controlled succession planning. So it affords the asset protection through bespoke governance um, and shareholders agreement and articles that a trust doesn't offer. So also FIC isn't in the relevant property regime that applies to trust, so no inheritance tax entry, decennial or exit charges. Shares can be gifted to the next generation, but with the restrictions in place, 
regarding transfer of capital for asset protection purposes. Their use in combination with trusts um, can be good, so shares can be held on bear trust for miners and a discretionary trust could hold, say, a G share for future grandchildren. This keeps the value within the nil work ban for trust tax charges and income can just be flayed up when needed, for example, if it's for schooling. The founder can retain control acting as a director. Um, the one thing to consider is from an inheritance tax perspective, um, HMRC apportion up to 25% of the company value to the voting rights, so they do need to be well thought out when they are being structured and set up. Finally, I think I've run out of time, family limited partnerships, another alternative vehicle for succession planning, but they are used much less frequently. Um, used to manage wealth across multiple generations, but an active management of assets is required. So they're subject to significant regulatory requirements and the cost can be quite significant. So they're used much less frequently for estate planning. Um, typically, we see them being used when clients have over £10 million and if, if they suit their circumstances. So, OK, key takeaway points. So. Owners should be advised to undertake a review now to consider if they meet the current wholly or mainly trading threshold um, and whether they would still meet it should the Chancellor align the threshold with the capital gains tax one. They might be advised to consider accelerating any lifetime planning now whilst BPR is available and how they might bank the relief for the benefit of the next generation and also to consider restructuring to secure the relief if possible. Thank you. I'll hand back to John. Thank, thank you very much, Helen. That's great. Um, if you like your acronyms, we've got lots of them here, fix and flips and everything else. But uh, there is a really good chapter on fix and flips in the book, which uh, which explains really very clearly what their, their potential is. Um, now I want to move on to one of the other partners in our London office, Ashley Hill who is one of my fellow Chartered Tax Advisors and uh, Ashley does work on flicks and flips, but also uh, does a lot of international work as well and contributed to our two chapters in the book on international elements. So he's going to flag up some of the issues we need to be aware of in that sphere. So uh, Ashley, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John, for that introduction. Uh, yes, as John said, I'm a partner in tax partner in the, in the London office dealing a lot uh, with international private clients. Uh, and when it comes to inheritance tax, one of the key things to think about for an international private client is, is domicile status. Because unlike income tax and capital gains tax, clients don't realise the difference is that domicile determines uh, the inheritance tax treatment. So if you're domiciled in the UK, you are subject to worldwide inheritance tax on your worldwide assets. But if you are non-UK domiciled, uh, but maybe resident in the UK, you are subject to uh, UK inheritance tax on your UK assets, but your non-UK assets are not subject to inheritance tax unless you become uh, deemed domiciled, which is you know, resident in the UK for 15 out of 20 years. Now this this is this is this is an issue I regularly have to advise clients on. I, I come across clients who are who might be non non UK residents. They have UK properties and they don't realise it's a UK site as asset. They've they've immediately got a, a UK inheritance act exposure on that asset. Uh, so it's an important point to flag the difference between domicile and inheritance tax. And I'm not going to go into the, the domicile rules. Uh, which are based around English common law in, in any detail now that they are covered off in our, in our book. If you, you're going to purchase our book, it's uh, some nice a nice neat summary in there. But what I will point out is some of the some of the issues which come along with with domicile and, and points to note. In particular, some of the recent uh, changes which have happened uh, over, over the past few years uh, to, to, to be able to be aware of. Uh, the main one of those main changes is the 15 out of 20 year rule. So once you become deemed domiciled for inheritance tax, if you've been resident for 15 out of 20, 20 years, uh, this prior to April 17, when this rule came in, it was 17 out of 20 years. So it's been brought in line with the income tax and capital gains tax rules. <laughs> so everybody is deemed domiciled 
after being resident for 15 out of 20 years. Uh, a, thing, a thing to, to note, which also, also came out in 2017, was something called the form, formerly domiciled residence rules, which basically catches an individual who has left the UK, acquired a domicile of choice outside the UK uh, under UK common law. So consider, the, consider themselves to be non-UK non domiciled on that basis, but then comes back to the UK for, for a period of time and becomes resident again. So if they uh, originally had a domicile of origin in the UK and, and become resident again in the UK, the, the IH2 rule, IHT rules are switched back on again for, for the years when they're UK tax residents. So why does this matter? Well, it, 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 I've come across cases and we, we do come across cases where individuals have settled offshore trusts, uh, which have got an IHT excluded property status. And if they come back to the UK and have formally uh, fall into these FDR formerly domiciled residence rules, that trust will lose its inheritance tax status uh, whilst that individual remains in the UK. So it's something to watch out for. Uh, the other thing uh, with, the, with these rules is the former domiciled residence rules is there is a grace period for one year which can uh, which can assist some clients. If you come back to the UK for one year, that, that rule won't apply. I was going to mention the, the the other the other issue with domicile which you come up come across from time to time and where HMRC might challenge is if an individual comes to the UK uh, they are they are non dom but they decide to settle permanently in the UK with a, a permanent intention uh, and they do that within uh, you know before they become deemed domicile so i.e. before 15 years they could find actually they they become domiciled here, they will become domiciled here subject to worldwide inheritance tax uh, before 15 years, which might be, a, might be a shock to them. So you've got to be quite careful about uh, domiciled individuals, non-domiciled individuals you need to be quite careful coming to the UK with a permanent intention uh, of uh, residing in the UK. So that's something to watch out for. Another, another point to which I often have to advise clients about is uh, mixed domicile scenarios so where you have a an individual, uh, say a husband or wife who is UK domiciled, but the their spouse is non UK domiciled. And normally uh, you will you'll know that there's a spouse exemption uh, for between uh, gifts or, or in lifetime or on death uh, between husband and wife. But if it's if if the transfers from a, a domiciled individual to a non domiciled individual, that spouse exemption is limited to three hundred twenty five thousand pounds, which can cause some problems if, if, if a large estate is passing because it could end up with a, a large inheritance tax exposure. Ways around that things to think about is it is possible to make a, a, a domicile election, meaning that the, the spouse who's making the transfer, who is UK domiciled, uh, can, well, sorry, sorry, the spouse who's receiving the uh, assets can actually, who is non-dom, can elect to be uh, deemed domiciled, uh, make an election accordingly, and then will be subject to uh, worldwide inheritance tax on on their estate. That is, is of course the downside that they're subject to worldwide inheritance tax. But if that spouse then decides to leave the UK and having left the UK for four consecutive years, that domicile election will uh, cease to apply. Uh, so that's an, that's something else we uh, is worth pointing out to clients. Uh, and, and with that as well, it, it, it often comes about when you are advising clients on, the, on their will planning, uh, how to structure their wills properly. And of course, whilst doing the will planning, inheritance tax is, is such an important aspect at the same time. So, what I'll, what, will I, what I'll also want to, want to touch on, so what does it mean if you are non-UK domiciled and, and your non-UK assets? Well, the important point there is, is to look at what the rules around where are your assets cited for inheritance tax. Uh, now, unlike capital gains tax, capital gains tax in, has this, the CGT CITUS rules uh, embedded in the legislation. Inheritance tax is, is different. There's no, there's no, it's not in the legislation. Instead, you have to look at case law and international private law. Uh, and and there's, diff there's different rules 
around different assets, uh, whether it's a bank account, whether it's a property. Bank account is normally a bank account is normally cited where where the uh, the branches, obviously, move, uh, immovable property like uh, homes are cited where they're located. But the rules around debts uh, and company shares and uh, debentures are, are slightly different, and you have to look at case law. Uh, so in our book, we, we, we've set this out, what, what the different rules are for, for situs of assets. Uh, and also it's in the IHT manuals as well. So the other important aspect then for, for the domiciled and, and non-domiciled individual is excluded property. So assets which aren't subject to inheritance tax are called uh, excluded property. They're excluded from inheritance tax. And one of the classic examples of this is uh, an excluded property trust. So a, a non-domiciled individual can set up a, an offshore trust, uh, provided they set it up when they're non-domiciled, inserting, settling uh, non-UK assets. Uh, those assets are held either in the trust or an underlying company, uh, or even UK assets can be held in the underlying company, they will be, they will have permanent exclusion from inheritance tax. So that's a very useful tool which we, we still advise on. Uh, what one important change which you need to be made need to be aware of is uh, UK residential property held in such structures. So UK residential property which was held in an offshore company underneath a trust no longer qualifies for excluded property status. And this was a big change in 2017 uh, to combat uh, the situation, which is which for many, many years, uh, most non-domiciled individuals owning UK residential property were owned by uh, structures like this. So the, uh, the government decided to change that back in 2017. And there's some quite complex rules around uh, around those structures and also where loans have been made to those structures and you can they're called relevant loans and such loans can also uh, be subject to inheritance tax. That also covers loans to trusts, loans to individuals. So if, 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 if a parent loans funds to a, uh, a child to buy a property in the UK and that parent is non-UK domiciled, uh, you, you can end up with that loan if it's been used to acquire UK residential property being subject to inheritance tax in the hands of the parent as well. So you need to be quite careful around that. Uh, the last the last change which came in very recently actually Finance uh, Act 2020 uh, for excluded property is around offshore trusts. Uh, so if, if you if you're non UK domiciled uh, or, and set up an offshore trust, but then you become deemed UK domiciled and decide to add more assets to that trust. Uh, it has been clarified in, in case uh, following a case last year and in legislation. Uh, I just mentioned that that addition will no longer be excluded property. And also you need to be quite careful if you have a, a settled an offshore trust, which is an excluded property trust and that trust transfers assets to another excluded another trust, which is assumed to be excluded property trust. That won't be the case if the individual who set up the uh, the second trust is uh, UK domiciled at the point of the transfer. So you need to be quite careful about transferring between trusts. And that rule came in last year, like I said, just to, as a clarification following a case earlier. So the final, final points I wanted to touch on, uh, I've got limited time here, is from an international spe uh, perspective is uh, IHT relief. Uh, there's two forms of relief if you're paying IHT in, in two different jurisdictions, either in the UK or, or overseas. The two, two forms of relief are unilateral relief, which, uh, which basically says that uh, the UK will give a credit for foreign taxes paid uh, as uh, against the UK IHT. The other form of relief uh, which is available is double tax treaty relief, and there's a number of uh, capital taxes treaties. Uh, can offer relief. So different, slightly different depending on which treaty the country is with. So some override the deemed domicile rule. Uh, of, of others, uh, other treaties, they look at uh, almost tiebreaker provisions to see where 
domicile uh, might rest. And uh, I think that's the end of my slot, so I will pass back on to John. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you. OK, so let's uh, then go on to um, think a little bit about estate planning in um, for more sort of UK based things. And um, we noted earlier on the three elements of estate planning that we seek to bring together as much as possible, the legal, the tax planning and the financial planning, um, where we look to get better solutions altogether. And this is particularly relevant to RNRB, the residents no rate band. We cover RNRB planning in great detail in the book, partly because I'm a nerd who absolutely loves this subject, but no, no, it's not just that, because it's really important. It is complex, it is really difficult, it presents lots of planning challenges. Now, some lawyers say they hate RNRB because of that very complexity, but it is that complexity which opens up real opportunities for us and opportunities for us to add value for clients, to say to clients, well, you can do that, but what about doing this? And you could save so much more tax in doing it that way. And I've only got a few minutes here, but I particularly want to focus on the two million pound taper threshold. And I imagine you're familiar with the concept that if you get an estate that goes over the two million pound level, you're gonna lose the residence bill rate band, one pound for every two pound over that limit. Uh, and that is um, uh, therefore effectively going to give you a marginal IHT rate of 60%. For that band of capital, over 2 million, you're going to be paying effectively 60% marginal IHT. That's a hell of a rate of tax. We can save potentially 70,000, or if it's a double RNRB, 140,000 of tax liability. So we really want to keep RNRB if we can. And how do we do that? There are two big things we want to do to, to, to do that. And partly that is legal by getting the wills right. Making good use of the nil rate band discretionary trust as Katz talked of earlier on to reduce the estate of the first um, on the first death so that therefore on the second death there is a lower estate which is less likely to be over the two million pound limit. But we also need to think about how the assets and income are used during one's lifetime. And this is financial planning, and this comes back to my three-legged stool. Working with us doing the legal and the tax, working with the financial planning and the investment management to try and find a way in which we can help clients to spend capital in a planned way rather than drawing down the pension. I mean, one of the big things we need to, and I'm sure financial planners are advising on all the time, is, is that pension death benefits written in trust are not part of the two million pound equation. And we also know that for a lot of clients, spending capital is a total anathema. But the great, need, great news is that financial planners have got a tool that will help to help clients get over that emotional hurdle. The, the cash flow modelling, whereby we can present options for clients and show this is how it works. You can spend this capital down and you will get to a point where, OK, you might run out of capital when you're 106 or 110, but you're OK till then. And that gives that reassurance. You can then do the tweaking. You can say, well, what if I did that? What if I did that? You know, make those little changes and we can see how that happens. Now. I know that for many lawyers, this is taking them out of their comfort zone, it, it, but it is good planning. It is really good tax planning to think about this and to work with financial planners on these kind of joint solutions. And they may have a legal element as well, because in many cases, there may be a trust of that first estate, that from the first estate, a trust for the surviving spouse, and that trust has is a life interest trust, which is going to be aggregable with the surviving spouse's estate and therefore taxed as part of that two million pounds, looked at as part of that when we're looking at the two million pound level. So it might be we need to release capital to a spouse that they can then spend. It might be, for example, we release the ISA, which, which otherwise would be in the trust so that the, the ISA can be inherited. They can then keep the actual investments, the underlying investments in the ISA. 
And that then enables them to spend down that capital, spend down that, 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 that resource. Capital, which otherwise would be subject potentially to a 60% IHT charge and bring down to a point where we have less worry about going over that limit at the end of the day. So we've got a part legal solution and a part financial solution to save an awful lot of tax. But can I encourage you to get those wheels right in the client's lifetime, to pick up one of the questions that somebody raised and also the point that, that Kat made earlier on. Please don't rely, leave it until after someone dies and rely upon having a variation. And the reason I mention that is variations have a great role, but they're always a second best. And DOTAS, the Disclosure of Tax Avoidance Schemes, is a way in which shows that the revenue can challenge a trust created by a variation in a way they can't challenge wills. Thank goodness we still have freedom of testamentary disposition. We can still make wills the way we want to make them. And if we're administering somebody's will that they've made and now they've died, no one can challenge that in a way they can challenge a variation. So let's really make sure that we're encouraging clients. Let's do a simple cost benefit analysis. Let's say actually it's worth spending a bit more money now to get the wheels right now because potentially that could save a lot of tax later. I hope that's helpful. I hope that gives you a few thoughts on estate planning and how ways in which we might potentially be able to work together. But I want to finish now with one of the big questions people ask. What happens if, if my client is losing capacity? Is it, all, is it all done for? Is there any hope left? There is hope because Kelly Gregg will tell us how. Kelly leads our later life team within, within uh, Irby Mitchell. And she is the absolute expert to give us some guidance on how you can still do something when you've got declining capacity. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you, John. So I think one of one of the questions that we often get asked is what happens if um, the person with the assets has lost capacity? And there tends to be two schools of thought. You'll get those that think that nothing can happen. It's too late and therefore we should just leave it and we just put have to put up with the tax that's payable. You also get some families that um, will carry on regardless with no regard for the law whatsoever and do uh, transfer large amounts of money to from from P's estate um, on the basis that it's tax planning. Now, in some of these cases, P might not even, even have had an inheritance tax problem, but the defence they always give in court when we're looking at their removal is it was inheritance tax planning or it was what P would have wanted. So we need to look at, at, a, at a bit of a middle ground, really, because you can't, as an attorney or deputy, just go off and do whatever you want. But you shouldn't also, as an attorney or deputy, just assume that all is lost and do nothing because you do have a duty to consider whether any action should be taken. Now, any uh, the, the law that governs people that lack capacity is that everything that's done has to be in their best interests. So um, Section 4 of the Mental Capacity Act governs that. It's very, very clear. It's got to be in the person who, who lacks capacity, their best interest, not in their family's best interest, not in um, some man down the road, not in his best interest, not in their lawyer's best interest, the accountant's best interest. What's in P's best interest? But that can include being remembered for having done the right thing. So you may think, well, if I'm doing this to save a huge amount of inheritance tax that P won't actually see the benefit of because he will be he will have died by the time that set even comes into play. It, it's not that you, it's not that you can't argue that that's in P's best interest, because it may be that actually it, it, you can demonstrate that that's something that he was uh, very keen to do. Perhaps he had previous history of, of tax planning and all those things need to be considered. So we know from uh, GM, which is in 2003, uh, Denzel Lush gave some very clear guidance about what can be done without uh, court authority. So if you are in a position where you are acting for a person who has lost mental capacity to make a gift, um, then you can, as their attorney or deputy, give gifts up to the annual exemption. So £3,000 or £6,000 if, 
if nothing was given in the previous year. And uh, you can also utilise the small gifts exemption. So that's £250. Now, usually small gifts exemption is £250 up to any number of people. In this case, uh, Mass Lush was, or Seen Judge Lush as he was then, he was um, very clear that it's only up to 10 people that can benefit from the small gifts exemption. Now, that you can only use that if P has a life expectancy of less than five years. If the estate belonging to P exceeds the nil rate band for tax purposes, um, and this case was obviously decided before the residence nil rate band. Um, so at that time, it would have been the 325,000 rate. But further case law has now said that actually that that um, that limit is to include the residence nil rate band. So P has to have an estate above what they'd be able to claim under the residence nil rate band and their nil rate band. And the gifts have to be affordable, um, having regard to P's care costs, and they cannot adversely affect P's standard of care. So what P can't do or what people can't do on his behalf is give away all of his money and then expect him to rely on local authority funding for care, for example. Aside from that not working um, from a, a deprivation of assets point of view, the court wouldn't, wouldn't allow it for tax purposes either. Um, and you also have to demonstrate that there's no evidence that P would have been opposed to making gifts of that way. So if P had never made gifts before um, and perhaps had been reluctant to do so, then it's unlikely that it would succeed. You'd be able to succeed under that. Uh, the, the Office of the Public Guardian issued some very helpful guidance following that case, which sets out the criteria in more detail. So it's always a good idea to have a look at that before you do anything. Um, but also to remember that it's not just cash we're talking about when we're talking about gifts. So it might be that there's an interest free loan given to a family member that would constitute an element of gift. It might be that there are um, adap adaptations undertaken to a property that somebody else benefits from or whose the name that the, the title to the properties in somebody else's name that will constitute a gift. It might be that you've got a, re a relative living in the property rent free and not providing any benefit to P that could that could constitute um, a gift. And so you need to be very careful that there isn't inadvertently a gift that you haven't sought the court's approval from just because it's not in a cash nature. So if. If we've demonstrated that there is a gift already that's already been made or that there that it should that a gift should be made for inheritance tax purposes, then we do need to make an application to the Court of Protection for approval uh, unless it comes within the remit of, of REGM. And um, John's lined me up very nicely, actually, with his um, three legged stool um, that he talks about because one of the fundamentals um, that I always tell my clients when you're making an application to the court for approval is you need to work together with the professionals to get a good applicant. A good application needs to be submitted, and that includes a, a very strong cash flow analysis. So you need to demonstrate that P is not in need of those funds. And if you if you just provide commentary that you don't think P will need them, that's not suitable. It needs to be very, very clear, taking into account P's assets, their investments, the proposals that you're planning to make um, in, in the report presented to the judge because the judge wants to see it in black and white. That this is affordable for P, which is one of the criteria. Um, I want to talk a little bit about business property relief because this um, just before Christmas, this was a, a very hot topic on LinkedIn and I was asked to provide some some commentary. So when individuals thought that tax planning was not possible for um, people that lack capacity, one of the things that started being um, uh, marketed was investments in business property relief solutions for those that lack capacity. Now that might be a, sim uh, 
an, an AIM investment, but there were all sorts of other products marketed. Um, and one of the one of the things that was all over the literature was this was something that was very easy for attorneys or deputies because you don't need court approval and you don't need um, because the asset is not actually leaving P's estate. You don't need to um, you don't need to get to go to court for, for authority. However, um, given since 2016, the court have been very, very clear that if you are the attorney or deputy and you want to invest P's assets in anything that will provide an inheritance tax saving, for example, a, something that will benefit from business property relief, but you will directly or indirectly benefit from that, you need the authority of the court. So as an example, uh, where I act as a professional deputy, I am perfectly entitled to invest P's assets in uh, investments that would qualify for, for BPR. Um, and provided, of course, that that's the right thing to do for P. However, if I was acting for um, uh, my mother in a, in a personal capacity as her attorney um, and I invested her assets in BPR assets on the basis that I was going to save inheritance tax on her death because I'm going to inherit her estate, then that would need authority from the court. And so I think there's still a large number of um, uh, situations where this authority is not being sought from the court and we are now seeing it catch up with people and there have been numerous cases where people have been removed for acting inappropriately and not taking the correct advice. Um, the, I want to say a little bit about statutory wills and codicils. So if you are a um, individual, sorry, if, if P's lacks capacity, don't think that um, changes can't be made to their will. Um, it can be by way of a statutory will, and this can be helpful in cases where you need to reassess or um, rework what um, P has provided in his will, not necessarily changing his wishes, but things like he they may have left a gift of property to an individual and the property is now sold to, to save that asset and ensure that it pass the value of that asset passes to the beneficiary. Um, to ensure that the main residence is left to lineal descendants so that the RNRB can be claimed, to um, ensure that you've left the 10% to charities so that you can claim the 36% rate, for example. So there's lots of planning opportunities available for people that lack capacity provided you make the necessary applications. And then the final point to mention um, is if P has inherited um, their from somebody's estate, it is possible to make an application to the court for a deed of variation on P's behalf, depending on the circumstances. So very um, uh, common situations where this is accepted is where there needs to be a readjustment of assets. So perhaps business property assets have been left to a spouse and the uh, tax assets have been left, the, the taxable assets have been left to, a bench, uh, to, to another child and we want to um, swap them over. That's something that the court will, will consider and very, very recently, although I'm not sure how long this may hold up for, um, there has been a successful application in the court for a deed of variation to protect assets for care home fees. Um, and I'm aware I've gone completely over my time, so I'm going to stop talking now. Thank you very much, Kelly. Um, getting Kelly to stop to get so into the subject is great. There is so much we can say on all of this, it, and uh, and I hope some of what we've said has been really helpful and relevant for you. We are going to run on for a few minutes because we've got some really great questions, and thank you for all of those questions you've posted. Um, we, we're going to run on for a few minutes. If you have to go, don't worry, we will send you a recording of all of this so that you'll see the answers. Um, if you've given us a, 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 an email address, we can come back to you personally. Um, I'd just like to pick up one or two of the questions and just, just quickly um, uh, deal, deal with one or two key things that have been raised. And one of them is about uh, civil partnership. 
Um, yes, one of the great things about the change in civil partnership now is that anybody can be a civil partner subject to, you know, you can't be siblings and so on. But 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 it, it means, therefore, that if you don't want the, the, all the baggage of marriage, there is the alternative of getting civil partnership and still getting the status of, of, of all the tax breaks that that, that, that that comes with marriage. So that's good. Gifts out of surplus income. A couple of people asked questions about that. And the two real key things to remember, if you are going to make the most of this, you've got to A, make sure your clients have got some surplus income and make sure they are uh, putting um, they're uh, recording their expenditure so we can see they've got some income left over to use for the gifts. And secondly, they've got a commitment to go on with the gifts. So if they're going to pay school fees for the grandchildren, let's get that in writing so that we can say it's not a one off. It's a start of a series of payments that sets up that pattern that we that we need. Um, a couple of people have asked about 10% uh, giving to charity, which, uh, which, which was just mentioned just now by Kelly. Um, it is quite a complicated thing because the 10% figure is quite difficult. There's real opportunities there, great opportunities to reduce the tax bill on the estate by going down to a 36% rate. But you've got to get the detail right. And some of the clauses that people put in wills can run to the best part of a page of A4 text. Now you can say, OK, I want to keep it simple and get it wrong. Or you can get it longer, better and get it right. I believe the second is the way to do it. And that's what we would hope you would want to do and to, to make help your clients to get that right. So they make sure they don't miss that 10% because of some complicated technical reason. A um, couple of people asked about the APPG, the All Party Parliamentary Group, which, which reported last January and made some hugely big changes or suggested some. They said, basically, IHT is so complicated that we cannot reform it, we've got to just totally change it and go to very simple 10% rate, make it nice and simple and, um, and and have most of the reliefs and exemptions go. Is that going to come in? I think that's quite unlikely, um, but I think it's an outlier. It's something that then enables the Chancellor to look at something like the, o the OTS reports and say, well, actually, here is here is something that is worth considering. You may also have seen the Wealth Tax Commission, which reported a few weeks ago and recommended a one-off wealth tax, not an annual tax, really important. They didn't want an annual one, but recommended a one-off tax. That I think is a serious proposition for addressing the, 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 the current situation with, with paying for COVID. So um, there, there we can, um, you know, I think we can see lots of potential. Um, Kat, do you want to pick up a couple of points on the OTS and the CGT? I was going to come back on email to, on that question, John, because it's... It OK, that's fine. That's lovely. Quite that's a big, cool. um, there's quite a few no, recommendations that, in there, um, just because we're short on time. Lovely. OK, that's great. Um, uh, one other thing that I'd like to just uh, to pick up here is um, the... Um, um, the, 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 the question of, of, of DOTAS and an example that um, that might help with some people with, with just seeing one of the issues about DOTAS and the way that DOTAS works. But um, uh, some of you may have come across the arrangement whereby somebody living, an adult person living in a property has one of their adult children move to live in with them and then they give them a share of that property. Um, that, that sort of scenario can work really well but the revenue said you've got to make sure that the share that's given to them is not is not disproportionate, and 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 there are real issues about the situation where maybe somebody tries to give eighty or ninety percent of a property to a member of the family who moves in with them, and there's a shot across the bounds from the revenue on that, which is one of the things we have to to look out for. Another really good question somebody's raised is in relation to. Um, the, um, uh, the, the, the possibility of two RNRBs where someone has been a widowed. You use it or lose it. And there is an opportunity if, if you've got a couple who've both been widowed to get four RNRBs, but you've got to use them. If you don't use them, you lose them. So um, that's a real good case of kind of RNRB can, can double up, can quadruple up, 
but you've got to do the wills right to uh, to, to be able to use that uh, fully. Um, OK, let's just see. We've got lots of questions here. Uh, Ashley, did you want to pick up one of the questions? Yeah, sure, sure, John. I think there was a couple. Of, I've not seen any questions for me specifically, but I think there was a couple of questions on uh, family investment companies. Uh, one of them uh, for, for Helen, but Helen's uh, had to slip off, so I'll, I'll answer that. So I think one of the questions around can can a family investment company invest in BPR assets? Uh, the, the answer is yes, uh, it, it can. But, you know, to, to see if the company, the FIC gets uh, BPR, you have to go for the normal sort of test. You have to have a look at what else, what else has it got in there? So is it is it wholly or mainly investing in BPR assets or has it got lots of other investments which might fail that wholly and mainly test? And you also have to look at, you know, the, for, for BPRs, the accepted assets test as well. So you, you have to look at those sort of angles, just like you do for any other sort of company. Uh, to see whether if it's a trading company, it's got investments. It, are those investments tainting the the BPR? So that was uh, that was one of the questions. Uh, I think there was another question around: Can you exchange do it do an exchange of shares in a trading company for for shares in a FIC? Uh, I assume that the, the 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 person is asking about share for share exchange. There, uh, got to admit, never really looked at that, but I'm not sure whether HMRC. Uh, would accept that there's there's commercial reasons for doing that, uh, unless there are obviously strong commercial reasons. If there's any sort of tax motivations for doing that, I think uh, clearance might be denied, meaning that there's CGT and possibly stamp duty implications. So it just depends on the reason why there was a share for share was wanted. Thanks, Ashley. Um, somebody's asked for clarification. Uh, I've, I've talked about having potentially four RNRBs. Um, an RNRB is 175k, so a double is 350. If you have been widowed and you've got to carry forward from your late spouse's estate because they didn't use their RNRB, you've got two. If you use those two, then you've you then then you, you're okay. Your spouse can then use their two if they've also been widowed. So you can potentially have 700,000 between the between the two of you. I mean, it's a huge pleasure. You've got to get the wills right. There's a really big issue there about the wills, but there is great potential there uh, if if you get, get that detail right. Um, Kelly, there's a couple of good questions for you. Would you like to pick up a couple of those? Yeah, sure. Um, so one of them is about timescales for a decision um, for the approval of gifts to the Court of Protection. Now, what I will say about this is it depends on your application. So if you put a very good comprehensive application together that covers all the things the judge is going to want to know, then you can get it through much, much quicker than if it's true. <coughs> so, um, for example, if you don't include a cash flow analysis, I've seen applications like that. It's all just it's going to get battered back to you. Um, so typically you, you could be looking at about a six month window for getting that approval through. Um, however, if there is a, a need for it to progress quickly and urgency, then you can ask the court to expedite that. Um, another question I've got is um, if if the financial advisor is recommending the BPR products, do you need approval from the court? Yes, you do. If the person that's going to take out the action, the attorney or the deputy will benefit indirectly or directly because they are the people that have to determine whether it's in P's best interest to enter into that um, to 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 buy that investment. Just because the financial advisor makes the recommendation, it's the attorney or deputy whose whose head it's on, really. And the court considers that there is a conflict of interest in making those decisions if you are going to benefit from any tax saving. So it's only cases where the deputy or attorney is an in, a true independent that do not need um, authority from the court. A um, very quick one about whether you can um, buy an annuity for P who's lost mental capacity. Attorneys and deputies can and they do that very frequently, um, especially in relation to um, INA, so immediate needs annuities for care costs. That's something that we regularly do if it's 
if it's the right thing to do for P. Um, and then the last one, can a mentally incapacitated beneficiary via their deputy uh, vary their entitlement into a disabled person's trust to protect means tested benefits? So if you asked me this 12 months ago, I'd say categorically no, because that was the view of the court. However, we have had recent um, uh, a recent case decided where that was possible, provided the circumstances are are right. And so um, I don't think it says who asked that question, but if they want to get um, to get in touch with me, I can I can give them some more information about that case and how we progress with that. Thanks, Kelly. That's great. Um, somebody's asked a question. Many of us are property rich and income relatively poor because of house prices in the south. Is it possible that a one off wealth tax might result in homeowners having to sell property to raise this? Obviously, that's the political dynamite of a proposal like a wealth tax. It's been carefully thought through, I think, and they have looked at issues that would avoid that situation. They've looked at how this can, could be done over a period of time to avoid the need for somebody to have to sell um, a, a property. But um, I, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I'm just saying that it's out there. And I think it's an interesting proposal that I think will get some serious consideration because, ladies and gentlemen, these are such exceptional times. I think there is a, a case for saying this is exceptional. This is a one off thing for this totally exceptional situation that we are in. I hope we've shown you today that there are lots of things that you can do to help your clients to mitigate their inheritance tax liabilities, to try and prepare, make the most of all the opportunities that are currently out there. There are a lot of opportunities that clients have to work the system, to make it work for you. We'd be pleased to help you if you've got any cases where we can help you to achieve those objectives. Um, can I thank all my presenters for, um, for all the people who've presented today? Can I thank you all very much for your participation? It's a terrific response to our webinar today. Some absolutely fabulous questions. Really good to get that feedback and those questions. If we haven't answered them, let us have your email and we'd be pleased to come back to you with those answers. I hope you found that helpful. I hope you'll find the recording also gives you another chance to think about some of these things. And we wish you well and we hope that you will find this a helpful resource to uh, help you to help your clients to get better results for them. Thank you very much, everybody, and uh, all the best to you. Thank you. Oh, and the next. Oh, yes, we've got a quarterly update coming. Uh, but apologies. Yes, on the 16th of March, we're going to have a quarterly update on inheritance tax. So do sign up for that. Uh, register for that and you will get you uh, our, our updates, which will be two weeks after the budget. Lovely. Thanks very much.